we want to back like disruptive technologies. So to give you an example, for example, we invested in nuclear fusion technology for mm-hmm. in-space propulsion, which will take minimum nine years to mature. But then mm-hmm. if, if it's a success, it means you can go to Mars in less than one month. So th- that's Amazing. really like a game changer. Welcome to the EU Startups Podcast. Sit back and enjoy the show hosted by Marcin Lewandowski. This episode of EU Startups Podcast is brought to you by Vanta. Are you building a business? Achieving compliance with frameworks like ISO 27001 and SOC 2 can help you win bigger deals, enter new markets, and deepen trust with customers. But this can also cost you real time and money. Vanta automates up to 90% of the work for the most in-demand frameworks, helping businesses get compliant quickly. And with over 300 integrations, you can easily monitor and secure the tools your businesses rely on. Join over 7,000 fast-growing companies that use Vanta to manage risk and prove security in real time. To learn more about how Vanta works and to get 20% off, visit vanta.com slash EU startups. That's vanta.com slash EU startups. Now, kick back and enjoy the show. Hey, everyone. This is Marcin Lewandowski, and you're listening to the EU Startups Podcast. My guest today is Helen Huby. Um, Helen is the co-founder and CEO of the Exploration Company, which aims to democratize space exploration. Before launching the Exploration Company, Helen served for a number of years as VP Orion European Service Module at... Um, Airbus Defense and Space. Alan is also the founder and chair of Urania Ventures and the Carmen Project. She also co-founded and is a member of the board of the Microbiome Foundation. Uh, everyone, give it up for Helen Huby. Uh, awesome to have you on the show, Helen. Hi, Martin. It's a pleasure to be invited. So, Helen. Um, Let's embark on a journey back to the very beginning. Um, what was the dream or vision that felt like, you know, a rocket launch propelling you into the world of space exploration and entrepreneurship? Yeah, well, when I was at Airbus and well, especially working on the Orion vehicle, um, I was experiencing, I would say, firsthand uh, the transformation of the space exploration business. Uh, I was seeing that uh, we'll have, in a, you know, not too far future, much more stations around the Earth, much more stations around the Moon, that we are going direction where I think there'll be, you know, ships flying to Mars um, mm-hmm. 2030, 32, 33, but like very soon, actually. And, uh, you know, if you look at who are the people or who are the companies or which are the countries uh, which are going to participate to this building of uh, the future of our humanity, yeah. At the end, you end up with very, very few companies, very, very few countries. True. And uh, I thought, okay, we, we need to do something so that as many nations, as many people, as many companies as possible can participate to the building of this future. Mm-hmm. Uh, because this is who will be in the next 50 years. And uh, that's why I decided to, to leave Airbus and to start the expression company, yeah. whose mission, as you exactly described, is to make space exploration accessible, to make it sustainable and to make it cooperative, really with the willingness to to enable every nation's company people to participate into this building of our of future. Mm-hmm. And we do that. The first, of course, the first step is a space capsule. So a spaceship, so with a capsule shape that uh, mm-hmm. we're currently building here uh, between Munich, uh, Bordeaux in France and Turin in Italy. And uh, we are we are going to have our first launch uh, in March, April this year. So that year is going to be important for us. <laughs> That's super cool. Um, so actually, you know, going from a giant like Airbus to launching your own spacecraft with the exploration company is like going from a well-defined orbit to exploring uncharted galaxies. So what inspired this change and was the most heart-pounding moment um, from the from this journey that that made you feel you know kind of weightless in both the literal and metaphorical sense so i think at the end i i decided to go for um, let's say the unknown territories because i felt like this was the right choice mm-hmm. um 
you have uh, one life and uh, there are if you think about it not many things you can do with this life this, this life especially if you want to create impact and you want to transform things you want to create impact you need to be focused and you need to create things which are new mm-hmm. and and which are useful um, So I thought, okay, if I stay at Airbus, perhaps I can contribute to transform Airbus. Like this may take very long, and perhaps I will, perhaps never be in a position of power that will really enable me to drive this transformation. Right. If I go out and I create a company that I can create the culture which I believe is right, I can create the product I believe is right. The chances of success when you create a startup are around about you know one to three percent. So it's very risky. Exactly. But then if you compare the impact you can have, it's worth taking the risk. So yeah, I thought it was it was the right choice. And when it's the right choice, uh, how to say it? The, the, the risk, I wouldn't say they do not matter. Of course, they are there and you have to mitigate them, but they are just part of the path. Uh, if you're convinced that's the best way to... My, My dream is to really, again, enable every nation, as many possible as people, to participate in that. And to do that, I thought, okay, it's more efficient to create my own company. Mm-hmm. And then, okay, there are some risks associated, but that's just part of the path. That's just part of the game. I love it. Um, so back at Airbus, you build a portfolio of like 20 plus new uh, profitable businesses, right? And w- w- so maybe what's the secret sauce for nurturing innovation? within a large like aerospace mm. corporation like Airbus and and how does that differ from fostering innovation in a startup um, in a startup setting well there are actually uh, lots of uh, similarities um, uh, first it's it's all about people Um, mm. Innovation comes with uh, ideas. Ideas are, you know, coming from people who are knowledgeable, who are innovative, who think a little bit outside the box, who yeah. just also driven by improvement. Uh, and uh, it's in both cases, it's to um, build enough trust so that people trust themselves. People trust that they'll not be blamed if they come with new ideas, but they'll be encouraged to try things, and that also failure will be accepted. Uh, so in both cases, can be cooperation, can be small companies. It's a question of culture, mm-hmm. um, and uh, it's also like uh, I think in both cases, uh, you know, there are many ideas at the expression committee. There were many ideas or whatever that I killed. Uh, you need to kill a lot of ideas very fast. And typically in the startup area, like you know, you have uh, one to three percent chances to succeed when you build a startup. Like same, you come with new ideas. There are very high chances that at the end is going to be killed. Mm. Um, what what really is different is that in a startup, if you don't succeed, you die. And if you're not highly innovative, what, why are you creating a startup? Because what kind of new stuff you bring? Yeah. So <laughs> you have to be very innovative, uh, and uh, and and then the sort of drive to make it happen is much higher than in big company because nobody's going to you know company is not going to be bankrupt if your idea doesn't succeed. Um, so that that's one very big difference. Uh, the other big difference is, um, let's say at Airbus, I, at the end of the day, you need to have uh, sponsors uh, to make it fly, basically. So mm-hmm. if really you come with a disruptive idea, meaning that's going to threaten the current business, the sponsorship needs to come directly from the CEO. No sponsorship from the CEO, the idea is going to die. Because like the, the the forces against this new idea that's going to disrupt or let's say to to disturb the current businesses are very very strong. Because even if it's part of the future, the current people here they want to keep their job, they want to keep their bodies for the next five years. They don't care about what's going to happen in 10, 15 years. Uh, so unless you have a CEO who is visionary, the chances are very high that the disruptive idea will never fly. Yeah. Um, so that's that's one big difference with a startup. Whereas a startup, you're here to disrupt the industry. You're here to build, you know, here right now the things that will drive the industry in the next 10 to 15 years. And and there is no problem of blessing of the CEO because this is your very core mission uh, to to build what will be you know market leader in 10, 15 years. So that that's one big difference. I really had to for the most disruptive idea to make sure that the CEO would bless them. And then for the loud sales, more improvement idea or incremental innovation, then very, very fast, 
I would try to make sure that uh, the CEO of a business unit or uh, someone with a PNA responsibility also would bless them because there is no point, you know, creating stuff that are not never applied. So mm-hmm. very fast in our industry, you need to have like 10 to 50 million investment. And this needs to come from a business unit which says, okay, hey, I see the value of that and I'm going to invest. So I was investing like kind of seed series A money with my budget yeah. and series A co-investing with the BU and then series B kind of the majority of money would come from the BU. Mm-hmm. Speaking speaking of investing, um, let's talk about Urania Ventures, mm-hmm. your deep tech investment company um, adds, you know, another layer to your to your journey. What led you to to fund Urania Ventures and, and how do you see the backing the next generation of deep tech companies? So I founded it because um, we have many, like it was founded like 10 years ago. So there was like no space tech fund in Europe or it was a very, very beginning of the space tech fund in Europe. Yeah. And uh, there was very little capital available for space entrepreneurs. So that was the, the very simple reason. Uh, I was seeing that deep tech, I believe actually is the next, you know, you had like web 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But now like the digitalization is completely changing the, the industry uh, and uh, okay space is an area where I'm a little bit knowledgeable so I said okay let's let's create a fund that would bring on the one hand uh, knowledge on the other hand like money uh, for the space investors in Europe um, the way it's different is that we we have a lot of freedom in the way we invest um, mm-hmm. so we back people who come up with disruptive ideas we basically of course we do the typical due deal from a financial point of view but on top of that yeah. we want to back entrepreneurs who are acting because they want to change positively the world in which we live. So this positive impact is something super important for us. We want to back entrepreneurs who are people of values, who really care about their teams. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we want to back like disruptive technologies. So to give you an example, for example, we invested in nuclear fusion technology for in-space propulsion, which will take minimum nine years to mature, but then mm-hmm. If it's a success, it means you can go to Mars in less than one month. So that's really like a game changer. That's amazing. Um, you're also you're also involved um, in the in another venture called uh, the Carmen Project, and um, I know that your mission there is to to foster trust in space exploration. Um, you know, and which is like kind of building a cosmic family. Uh, can you share a story or initiative that embodies the, the foundation's um, mission among those, you know, shaping the future of space? Yeah. Um, well, it, it's very simple, actually. Uh, again, working in, in, in the space business and seeing how space exploration is being built, how space future is being built, it's becoming more and more confrontational. It has become extremely difficult for Chinese and Americans, for example, to speak together to build trust. Uh, you know, they see each other in big congresses, in, in big space events, but like getting to know as persons has become very difficult because we have less and less programs that we share. And, and you get to know as persons when you work together on the same program. Like, you know, when there is shit happening on a space station, you have the Russian and the American working together to solve that shit. Yeah. So you get to know as persons like yeah. uh, brought by the same dream and, and brought by the same energy to find solutions to the same problem. And and we don't have that between the you know, two leading space powers of, of, of the world. Mm-hmm. And um, and of course, there is, you know, and I'm not naive, a lot of competition. There is also country, you know, some wars being prepared whatsoever. So the point of this, of this uh, foundation as a non-profit is to say it's extremely important to build personal trust between the ones who shape the, the, the future of the space industry, whatever the nationality is, whatever the background is. Um, because that trust is the way how you start building projects together. If you look back in history, the way the UN has been built, the way Europe has been built, Europe was built at the beginning just by three, three four people mm-hmm. who had the same dream and say, hey, we need to build a European Union. And they succeeded because they trusted each other. And same a company, etc. I start with few people who trust each other and have big dreams. So, but if these people cannot talk together, if, you know, Chinese people cannot talk to American people in a frame where they can really share their dreams and share their visions, that's not going to happen. So what we do is every year we select 15 people around the world. We pay attention to have Russian, Chinese, Americans, and also other nations. So all the, all the continents are represented. 
it's for everyone who is selected is you know top leader who can be ceo can be vice president whatever but like someone with high responsibility someone with power yeah. and someone with good intention and we bring these people together in four days under chatham households and we speak about how space is going to look like in 15 years in 10 years what are their dreams we invite keynote speakers nobel prizes etc so so that people also get inspired by the 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 path of, of the leadership path of others and then we ask or come and fellow say okay what kind of personal commitment or like what kind of group commitment do you want to take mm-hmm. and then we implement these commitments so that step by step we make space more corporate a better place and that hopefully the seeds which are we get to know each other they will transform into a common project afterwards amazing that sounds super cool uh, helen how do i how do i get in how do i get invited <laughs> so we're just going to open the applications uh, actually for uh, the 24 promotion uh-huh. and uh, you can go on kamatproject.org and uh, you can apply and you can also see who's been selected in the last uh, promotions amazing that would be awesome to participate in like to be surrounded by like all this talented people yeah it's really cool and there is real friendship uh, friendship be- being built uh, mm. and people having experience that's okay I, i never had a chance to you know really spend two, three days, four days with people. So it's it's not just being, you know, smart and visionary and having responsibilities, yeah. just being able to speak freely yeah. and to, to build things, you know, together. Exactly. It's also about being human and building a human connection. Exactly. Exactly. It's coming back to what humanity has, uh, has at its best. Amazing. Um, Helen, so I also know that um, you're on a board or maybe even co-founded the micro biome foundation um so you know like switching gears from outer space to <laughs> inner space yeah um, okay so yeah you're, you're, you're going through all the yeah <laughs> why is this the question the question or <laughs> sorry you want to ask why right uh, this i want or, to um... ask so i want to ask um yeah what's the story behind it because you know it kind of adds a bi- biological twist to your portfolio so what's the story behind it and um Did you find any parallels between the exploration of the microbiome and, uh, you know, and your passion for for space? Yeah, it's actually a, a personal story. Uh, one of my very close friend um, mm-hmm. discovered that okay, she she got a, a rare disease, and uh, which at the end, you know, decreased her life expectancy. Uh, sometimes significantly mm-hmm. um, so I asked myself okay what what can I do to to support right and uh, what is the state of the research and uh, okay long story short so um, someone else in the world actually <laughs> also got that he um, had that disease and he had the same reaction than me saying okay what what can I do for that mm-hmm. and uh, then the doctors put us into contact so uh, And uh, then we, we met and we said, okay, let's create together a foundation, a non-profit, so that we can we can fight against this disease. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and uh, we did that around about 10 years ago. Uh, then it was very focused on one specific disease. And then what we what we learned on the way is that um, the way you take care of your body, especially the way you eat and the, the impact of uh, your nutrition of your microbiome has a huge impact on you know curing diseases. Uh, so, and that this is not well known uh, and so we've kind of enlarged the spectrum of the foundation uh, focused really on the microbiome because it can impact you know autism it can impact much more diseases than the very rare disease we are focused on at the, at the beginning so that's just a very personal story and now it has become a foundation which is working and which is fostering research on, on this area uh, with impacting millions of people so it's it's good it's awesome It's beautiful. Um, I also know that um, you mentioned a bit about this already, um, that you want to build a business that is also, um, you know, that's bringing uh, positive social change. So I wanted to talk about uh, the fact that you're deeply involved in, in, in the social impact at Unis Social Business. Uh, can you share a story of a social project that resonates with you and or like maybe some initiative um, that you've been working on there and how does social entrepreneurship ca- kind of intersect with your vision for the future? So first, I think they're doing an amazing job and uh, they're you know, funding uh, 
tons of projects. Uh, one that comes into mind, for example, it was a depollution water project, and it's a profitable business. But it has also, a, you know, a very clear uh, positive impact on the on the society. Um, I think you know, profit has to be for something, right? Uh, yeah. It's it's uh, it's. It's very important to, to, to give meaning to what we're doing. It's very important to... Imp- okay, we, we just come here on Earth and then the question is, what can I do with our talents, with our intelligence, with you know whatever we, we've been gifted for to improve the situation and to leave the world a bit better than you know when we arrived? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and we can do that through... And, and we do that through our work, basically, and also through the love we bring to others. They are like material stuff, which is output of the work and non-material stuff, which is... The love we give to other, the that we are given to us, like the beauty we create. So artists, you know, they will not give to the world material stuff, but they give beauty. So, mm-hmm. um, the the in a business, it's it's um, you build a company which is like a body, and you have the responsibility for your employees, and uh, you create stuff. So, question is, how the culture you create create this this happiness? How do you create the love, you know, within the company to Unleash the talents of your people to give them trust, to, to give them disrupt that so that they can overcome obstacles. And and how does your product like improve the situation around us? What's the positive impact that you create through your company, through your product, or through your services? And then profit is just like it's super important. Company is profitable because that's that's the way for a company to be sustainable. Yeah. But then profit for me needs to be reinvested as much as possible. I mean, of course, a part of that needs to come to go back to shareholder who took the risk to fund the company with you or like who invested in the company, that's absolutely fine. Like the majority of the profit for me shall be reinvested in the company so that we can make even better product, better services, and then again, improve the world. And and this uh, philosophy of uh, the why we built a company and uh, the, the, the profit as the enabler of sustainability for good, mm. there is this philosophy inside, you know, the, the social business defined by Yunus. Okay, he's a bit more extreme than I am because he says, okay, nobody shall come back to shareholders, nothing shall come back to shareholders. I mean, I'm a bit caricaturing his position. <laughs> but, but the foundation, I'm, I very much believe in that, that the company itself is a beautiful and perfect tool to change the world around us. And if we look around, <laughs> I mean, in the past, let's say, 100 years, 50 years, the entrepreneurs have dramatically changed the world we live in. And the change is sometimes for the better and sometimes for the worse. But they've dramatically changed the, the world we live in. This is so true. Um, Helen, speaking speaking of sharing love with other people, um, you know, raising four children, I mean, it's rockets, telescopes and diverse cultural constellations must be a cosmic parenting adventure. Um, what's your secret ingredient to, uh, you know, for blending the excitement of space exploration with the with the warmth of a uh, nurturing home? And and how do you share a sense of curiosity about space, science, and diverse cultures with, with your children? So first, I have a wonderful husband, and he's supporting me like crazy. Uh, so also, second, I'm a bit old. Uh, you know, when I had my children, I was spending, uh, you know, a lot of time at home. I was always working, mm-hmm. of course, but like... Uh, given a lot of priority to the children, like the, the first 10 years of our marriage, now we are second 10 years of our marriage, uh, almost 20 years of marriage. And so he's giving me the opportunity to, to, to thrive. And uh, he's a CEO, so he has a lot of work to do. <laughs> but yeah. but he supports the family like uh, like, like crazy. So I have ways less to do uh, like from a time's perspective in the family. And I first want mm-hmm. to make it very clear I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing without his support this is absolutely clear so I see that as an equilibrium in the couple and, and um, Sugan is uh, I think every child has uh, different talents and uh, it's important for the for every child to get to know him or herself mm. um, so to understand in which direction you know I shall go to be useful to to the world basically so I think our role as parents is to to give trust uh, to our children and uh, so yeah to show them that we that they are the most precious person for us that we we already do we just want to, to them to be happy and that we we are willing to do everything we can to make them happy um, of course we also want to 
you know, to transmit some values, but there is nothing to, to say. Values is just like the way you act. Um, right. And then it, it, it's like a CEO in the company. Like you can say whatever you want if you act badly. There'll be very bad values in the company. Exactly. Same so with children. Like <laughs> so, example, so right? there is exactly. Uh, and for the curiosity, I think it's just like again, the way you act if you're if you're sincerely curious, genuinely curious about who your children are, like about everything. Then I think they'll develop a genuine sense of, of curiosity. But again, much more important for me that they are happy than you know they are hyper successful or whatsoever. And happiness is in discovering yourself, your talents, and expressing your talents, I believe. So. Love it, Helen. Um, I really like the approach. Um, so maybe, maybe you could paint us a picture of the future now. Um, what's the most thrilling vision you see for the future of space exploration? And, and, and how does the exploration company aim to contribute to that vision? So I think in um, between 2030, 2035, uh, thanks to SpaceX, and I, I want to recognize here like the immense contribution of, uh, of Musk, um, we'll have uh, regular ships back and forth uh, to and from Mars. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps beginning of 30s, maybe like, you know, two. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and around about 35, like, back and forth uh, but um, and and I believe we'll have like several mega constellations uh, around the earth I believe like 50% of the communication will come from uh, from space for broadband communication mm -hmm. like in the near future also most of the cars and planes etc they'll be automatized so they'll need also this you know a lot of communication to compute uh, all the data to, to master this automation and um and we'll have not only, you know, space stations around the Earth and Moon, but like different types of space stations, like military space station, civil space station, refueling space station, etc. So a complete different environment. Um, and uh, I'd like the exploration co company to really contribute on the full transportation chain. Mm -hmm. uh, we start with the capsule because that's a market which is growing. There are very few players and there is no player in Europe. So we believe we can become number one in Europe and one of the top players in the world. Um, but like, of course, we want to do more. So um, I'd love to see us uh, contributing with a vehicle that goes from Earth to space and space to space and back, can be reused, can be refueled, and which functions and be, is operated in a way where every country in the world has the opportunity to contribute to it. So I don't want to go much further because we have some precise ideas here at the expression company, but it's mm -hmm. not yet the time to, to share them because there is a time for everything. And right now we... We need to succeed with our capsule, but that's uh, how I'd like to position the company in, you know, around about 10 years from, from now, really a key player in transportation in the world and applying in our design and in the way we operate this uh, cooperation spirit. So we'll do it from Europe, but with many countries. This sounds amazingly uh, exciting and, um, and it's a near future. It's not that far away from us. So, um, nope. Juggling, you know, like juggling multiple ventures is a bit uh, because like you've been involved in so many projects. Uh, so like to me, like juggling these multiple ventures is a bit like orchestrating a cosmic ballet. Uh, if you by chance build a time machine in the future and could send a message to your younger self when you were, you know, just starting your space tech entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. a journey, mm -hmm. life journey, what advice would you? Would you share? Give to the young the Ellen? Right huh? What advice would I share to the young Ellen? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I think I would tell her to uh, trust herself more. <laughs> um, because I, um, I, I think I had this willingness to build uh, already since quite long ago. And then, uh, okay, I started like only like for real and at scale, two years and a half ago. Mm -hmm. So it's life, we will not change the past, but I would recommend her to, to go and build her company sooner. Amazing. I love it, Helen. Uh, thank you so much for this interview. Um, it's so nice talking to you. I could spend like hours talking to you more. Uh, I wish you all the best and good luck with your uh, endeavors. Thank you very much. And I hope, I hope to talk to you soon. Yeah, Ciao. thank you very much, Marcin. Have a good day. Goodbye.